I'm going to show you game three from the first day of the final of the Crypto Cup between Wesley So and Magnus Carlsen. I've already recorded a video showing game one. Do check that out. I won't give the game away and tell you what happened. Um, but let me just say that game two was drawn and now this is game three and it's another very, very exciting game. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and do subscribe. Let's try and hit 100K. And do consider supporting us via PayPal or Patreon. Right, here we go. Wesley with the white pieces. Now, intriguingly, the players repeated the opening from game one. So it's not a Gioca Piano. It's this D4 move. It's, it's an aggressive opening from white you know you're trying to well you're you know you're claiming a space advantage in the center it's very straightforward and you know you have straightforward development the only problem is black has this lovely knight on e4 which of course creates complications um, if that knight weren't there then white would have very good chances of building a kingside attack with that lovely spearhead on e5 now, in game one of the match, Wesley played queen c2. In this game, he played h3, and this is the most popular move in the position. Well, white would very much like it if black exchanged bishop for knight. Uh, bishop h5, played instead by Carlson, of course. And here, the most popular moves are queen c2 or simply castles kingside. Wesley played rook c1. Now, that is a rare move. This position has only been seen in a, in a handful of games, ser serious games. So what is the point of rook c1? Um, well, one idea is that very often in these positions, black wants to break up white's nice center that center pawn on e5. f6 is problematic here because of knight takes pawn. Queen takes and then just bishop c4. Pin and win. So that's a nice little tactical point. f6 is not a good move. Um, and another idea is that simply sometimes it might be nice to take here and Perhaps move the knight back, get some pressure there, swing that knight round. You know, that's not a bad idea. Um, knight e7 looks natural, but watch this. This has been played in a previous game here, and you can just go for it with h5. This is you know, very, well, extremely double-edged position. So clearly Wesley had done his homework somewhere along the line uh, between... Game one, game two, and now this game three. Maybe he had this little idea prepared anyway. Uh, maybe he had um, an assistant working in between the games to suggest a new idea. Who knows? Be interesting to find out. Anyway, Rook C1 played. Carlson played Bishop A5 after six and a half minutes thought. Now, already, I would say Rook C1 has paid dividends if Carlson is having to think for six and a half minutes. Remember, they only start with 15 minutes on the clock. So bishop a5 pins. Castles, let's step out of one pin at least. And now bishop takes knight. And knight a5. So Carlson playing in a, you could say, quite a, um, a formal positional way, trying to find a nice square for that knight on c4. But then again, he has given up his dark square bishop, so that must have come as some relief to Wesley. Um, he's, he's no longer fears any pressure on d4, and certainly if this diagonal ever opens, well, there's no dark square bishop, basically. So what does Wesley do? Still got to deal with that knight, and actually he took steps to do something about that. He first of all played g4, and then knight e1. So obviously g4 raises the stakes of the game because white's king is a little less secure after that one. But his plan is very clear. He's 
withdrawn the knight, he's going to drive away this knight and, well, potentially use this kingside majority. You see this kind of structure arising very often, or a similar structure arising from the open Spanish, where white also has this kingside majority and there's a knight on e4, which complicates matters. But this one looks quite nice. Remember that dark squared bishop is gone from black, so white's king doesn't look so bad in this position. f6 plays Carlson trying to open things up. f3 drives the knight back, or it will in a second. c6 first, and now, well, it would be inadvisable to take here because... Uh, well, the, the light squares on the king side don't look great. So bishop d3 keeps keeps things nice and solid. And the knight goes back here. Knight g3, I think that would end up getting trapped pretty badly. So knight g5. And now Wesley just plays in a very straightforward way. Exchanging pieces. And exchanging on g5. And queen d3. Okay, the downside of playing this for white is that this knight has a nice square on c4. The plus side is that these pawns look pretty strange. That is a nice pass pawn, and that is a very simple hit on the pawn on g6. Now, Carlson's next move looks a bit strange. He simply played knight c4 and gave up the pawn on g6. Why didn't he play queen e8? I mean, that looks very sensible. Defend the pawn, which, you know, keeps the king a little bit more secure. Well, I think he was worried about the, the, simply the time factor here. White has very easy moves. First of all, knight g2. And then white is just going to play f4. And after this is taken, the knight comes into a great position. Uh g6 is weak. I think the, the queen is very badly placed, uh, gets in the way of the rooks, you know, always tied to that g-pawn. It's very hard to see how black is going to gain counterplay in that position. So that's why Carlson here just thought to himself, well, okay, I'm not bothering. Knight c4. Queen takes g6, so uh, Wesley, so now a pawn up. Okay, how does white make progress in this position? He has an extra pawn. What do you do about it? Well, Wesley finds a really straightforward plan. Rook f2, excellent move. c5 from Carlson. He's desperate to find counterplay here because Wesley's plan, really simple, really strong. Rook here. Basically, you can see, he's just prepared his pieces nice and compact and he's going to play f4 to open up the f file and, and open up the king side and this is really powerful I mean there's there's nothing that black can do to, to hit the king um, Carlson just has to rely on his counterplay over here rook c6 at least drives the queen back queen d3 and here, well, Carlson could go into a poor endgame after this move. Um, he's a pawn down. And this looks pretty bad. That would... It would be miserable to play that position. Uh, or, I mean, quite, quite a straightforward position for white to play. Extra pawn. F4 is still coming. That's a nice, nice threat there. Not Carlson style to kind of grovel for a draw in a in a poor end game. He played rook a6. He's looking to keep the position complicated. But f4, Wesley continues with his plan. I think, you know, when you're playing rapid chess, blitz chess, what you need is a clear plan. That makes it really difficult for your opponent. And um, you know, Wesley played you know these last few moves very quickly queen g6 um i mean even if this is taken this is absolutely horrible 
dare I say it, split rooks. Um, these rooks look fantastic. And you know, this this position is actually hopeless. It's it's really unpleasant for, for black. There's threats here, um, potentially, you know, threats here. It it's it's terrible. It should be lost. So we've got the queen here, the pawn has come to f4, Carlson takes on h3, and Wesley just drove forward f5 and f6, and this is completely winning for white. Pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and this was the final position. White to play and win, queen g7 of course. Really simple tactic, and Carlson resigned. If queen takes queen, pawn takes, check, and then rook takes rook. White is a rook up. Well, very interesting. Um, very convincing win in game three. Um, if you don't want to know what happened in game one, you could always close the video now. Um, I should say that this leveled the score in the match. And... Game four was drawn, so the first set ended 2-2. So they play a second set tomorrow, and things are wide open. It's a fascinating contest. Thanks for watching.